This is the hermeneutics of the body, trauma, healing, and embodiment in scripture and in worship. Um, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope we can all kind of like learn and grow together and think about the transformative work that God is doing in us and our communities. So uh, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit, what is a hermeneutic? Um, some of you may, may or may not know. Really, it's just a fancy word for saying like, how do we read stuff? How do we make meaning out of the things that we read? Now, this word is used a lot, especially in like biblical studies because hermeneutics, how do we engage with scripture is big. But it also shows up in other academic fields as well. Um, and when I was in Taiwan, the last couple of years, I was doing a master's degree in musicology. And so part of my work in musicology was also talking a little bit about hermeneutics and meaning making within music. So that's kind of, the intersection of like my life, the things I'm interested in, and then how this became part of my academic career. So, um, this is this is like a bio, it doesn't, whatever. It's also online, <laughs> I don't really care. But I just told you kind of like some of the, the key parts. Um, I am Taiwanese American, I'm a woman, I'm bisexual. I've been coming to this conference tw since 2017. And, um, you know, I do music, I do film, I also do community organizing and kind of theological, like public theology, I guess is what I would call it, and kind of political commentary stuff, depending on what kind of like community organizing stuff I'm involved with. And as I mentioned, this is like kind of an abridged version of my master's thesis from um, National Taiwan University. And so in terms of like the research methodology, there's a field called ethnomusicology. Anyone <laughs> heard that word before? And um, basically it combines musicology with the work of ethnography, which if you think of like, what does an anthropologist do? They like do field work and they like get to know a community and then they kind of write about it. So that is like, we're doing that kind of like anthropological work, but amongst, you know, all music communities and their music, right? So that's kind of like, Basically, I wrote a thesis about my experience in the LGBT Christian movement, which has changed my life, kind of like what Kai said this morning. And um, there's just so many amazing things I learned and witnessed, and I was trying to figure out how to explain that to other people and how to share it. And so I kind of struggled because I was like, there's all these fields, and I'm like drawing from theology, I'm drawing from anthropology, sociology, psychology, music, stuff. Um, I found a discipline called theomusicology. It's rooted in the tradition of black studies and it's theologically informed musicology. And, you know, there's books about like, for instance, like protest and praise and the role of, you know, hymnody in African-American spirituals in the civil rights and the church and all of these liberation movements. And so I was like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I just want to give a shout out to John Michael Spencer, uh, who coined this term, and the black scholars who have come before to kind of empower me with the tools to find a way to talk about the things that we've lived and seen and the work that God has done. So as I mentioned, this is like very interdisciplinary. Um, there's like theology. I like do a lot of queer studies, reading queer theory. I use affect theory a lot in this work too, and also traumatology. So I know like a lot of us have PTSD or religious trauma, and this kind of emerge out of this really natural need, right? Like, how do I heal from that? How do I live? Um, how do I flourish and not just survive in the world that I live in? Um, I am not trained in traumatology though. <laughs> so I do read a couple books, but um, I'll defer like the really people who are like actually therapists to like answer those specific questions. Um, but I wanna start with a small little anecdote. So I was at the Reformation Project Conference in 2017 in Chicago, and I heard a song for the first time um, because I was kind of in a con community that did more hymns and not as much contemporary music. And it, and it was, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. And I stood in that church with like hundreds of other queer people crying and like singing this song at the top of my lungs. And I went home after that conference and I actually looked the song up 
and then I listened to it. And if people who know what I'm talking about, I was like, oh, 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 because in the middle of the song, the singer is like, we condemn the spirit of homosexuality. And I was like, oh, okay, like this song that I experienced in this LGBT Christian conference that like just expressed my crying out to God that felt so healing and meaningful to me was actually like the most popular rendition, the one that everyone knows is actually explicitly denouncing homosexuality as a disease, as sin, as demonic. And I just thought, I mean, this had kind of happened a lot of times. There were all these songs. I mean, I kind of mentioned this, like, in, you know, their, break, their session this morning. These were the songs of my childhood. But then I, I was singing them in these queer spaces, and they were transformed. And that kind of made sense to me in, like, the experience way. But then I was like, I think, I think I need to figure out a way to explain this, like, in musicology and theology. How does this work? Because it's something I already know is true, but we, I haven't figured out the, like, the math as I like to say. So this, this is interesting because I just defended this in an academic world where they're not connected to the queer Christian community. They don't know our stories or experiences. And so I, I interviewed a lot of people. I shared some of that to kind of back things up. You, however, are on the other side of it. This is your life, probably, <laughs> and your struggles. And some of it will, might, might feel familiar, and I hope that it gives you some language to talk about these things, because sometimes it just feels like when we're suffering, it's just us. And nobody else has maybe felt or experienced what we felt. And the gift that I've had in this community is when I heard from other people, I realized, wow, that's not, I'm not alone. It's actually not my fault. This is a system that is designed to hurt, to injure, to exclude me. And it, and it wasn't my fault, right? And so I hope that through this today, you can also find language for your experiences and also share that with other people too. So um, I'm hoping to eventually maybe publish as a book. So the longer form of the whole research will hopefully be out there eventually. But here's a quick outline. So <clears throat> uh, our first section is about trauma, right? Um, for me, it was like, okay, it's, this worship is really healing, but in order to understand why something is healing, we have to understand how the wound happens, because that actually affects a lot of how we treat it. And so uh, the concept of embodiment and disembodiment, displacement both, and I use the term the body under case to talk about our individual bodies, as well as the body uppercase to talk about the body of Christ. Then, in the sec second section about healing, about community and network, movement, the kind of stuff I was just talking about that we get to experience in places like this. And then, reclamation. Uh, I'll finish out with a quick conclusion, then we can also kind of hopefully do some question and response as well. So, section one, trauma. So, the body and the body. So the hermeneutics of whiteness is this term that I kind of coined because I was trying to figure out the way that people talk about the Bible and authority and how my experience, especially as a person of color who was a convert, whose family's immig family immigrated to the United States, that when I converted to Christianity, there was this idea that some communities were like the faithful and like the communities of God, and that they had the authority to tell me how to really be Christian. And so um, eventually what I realized is there's all these contradictions, because like these, you know, white evangelical communities that I'm a part of, they're like, we believe in the scripture and the God and God, and we are the only one, the only people who are properly interpreting this, or they don't say interpret, who are following the Bible. We are the only people who believe in the Bible and follow the Bible. Sometimes you even ask a church, what do you believe? And you say, We believe the Bible. What does that mean? There's a lot of people who believe the Bible, but some people's belief in the Bible seems to be more legitimate or more right than other people's. And there isn't, I was like, there isn't really a way to talk about that set of contradictions. And the other thing I'm gonna talk about is a Christian heterosexual script, which is an adaptation of a concept that I took from Sarah Ahmed, a queer affect theorist, and um, a, a topic, a concept called heterosexual soteriology and worship in the both spiritual economy and social economy of our lives. So, hermeneutics of whiteness. Enlightenment rationality, which we've talked about a little bit, it go, the concept I really wanna focus on here is who counts as a person? Right? And we've seen kind of throughout history, we've seen how some people are seen as less human or animalistic. They're not fully human, fully capable of 
you know, logic or rationality. Um, I was studying this sound studies scholar named Je Jennifer Lynn Stover, and she wrote this book called The Sonic Color Line and this concept called the listening ear. And she talked about how in the legal system that we use, like in a jury, that it's like, what would a rational person what is compelling to a rational person? This is a thing that keeps coming up a lot. And there's this idea that there's like, an, like one kind of, like one kind of rational person who would take this input and only have one kind of output, right? Which we've noticed is actually very inconsistent, but this is at the heart of some of our like philosophical and legal ideas. And she traces this thing to uh, the senses, the five senses. Every, she is, like, people assume that we all experience the five sens sensory out inputs the same way, and therefore we should have the same outputs. But the reality is we know there's actually discrepancy. Like, we all, like, there's a range of human frequencies, like frequencies humans can generally hear in the range of, but each person has a different frequency response in their listening. They, their touch, their sensitivity, their, you know, they're, I'm, I wear really thick glasses. So like what I'm able to see, and I have astigmatism, like my interactions with light are actually different than other people. But so if we assume that the body is neutral, it's like standardized and objective, then we would assume that all of the way that sensory input is, is, is also standard. But as we know through experience, that's not true. The other thing that this connects to is this, like, I've heard people say, like, oh, I don't really think about my body. I'm just, like, a floating brain, right? I'm just consciousness. But there's actually this really deep connection between how we think and experience things, just like we just talked about, and the body. And we live in a culture that really emphasizes the mind and not the, the way that our mind is not just a floating head <laughs> but connected to a whole body. So this is connected to what I call the myth of objectivity, right? We're talking about like everyone has this like neutral, objective way of experiencing and thinking about things. And because of that, some bodies are seen as authoritative and some bodies are seen as like subjective, right? So probably a lot of you have heard like, you can't make a decision on that because you're subjective. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but then you're saying that you're objective in this, right? Like you're corrupt, I'm corrupted, but you're not. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in my community heard from their pastors, they're like, you can't trust yourself. You can't trust your body. And then my answer to that is though, so whose body am I supposed to trust? Right? Because he's, usually he, <laughs> what he is saying is that I am objective and neutral and my body, which is connected to my rationality and the way I interpret, is more right or more true than yours is. So when I'm not, it's not that we can't, like we're all subjective, right? We all have our limitations. But some people are saying my limitations are actually not limitations and my body is more authoritative, more right and more able to interpret than you. So this is kind of this matrix that I created this, you can see at the bottom, correct body, correct belief, right? So someone who has the right body can make a good interpretation, an authoritative decision, whereas someone in the wrong body can have the wrong, it, they're not capable of producing the wrong, the like correct belief. And so oftentimes I'll see it like this, like in my communities, they're like, oh, they only believe like white theologians or, or white pastors. And maybe they themselves are Asian, maybe they're Taiwanese or Chinese or Korean or whatever. And so like they, they're like, well, I have to trust the interpretation of someone with the right body, <laughs> the authoritative body. And this is kind of what I'm talking about is like the hermeneutics of whiteness. It's actually reading through your body as being right and some bodies as being wrong. And so this is where I kind of talk about the concept of displacement and supersessionism. If any of you here have read Willie James, Wen Willie James Jennings, The Christian Imagination, this book was so influ influential to me, I highly recommend it. He talks about the way that Christianity constructed our concepts of race. And a lot of that actually comes with what's called supersessionism. So the Bible, both Old and New Testament, were mostly written by Jewish people talking to other Jewish people. And I would guess that most of us here are Gentiles. <laughs> However, the way that we replace Jewish people at the, as part of the center of God's story and put ourselves in it and said, this is a displacement. So like when we read the Old Testament, like, oh, and we'll like in Israel, we'll magnify God or these things. And people kind of substitute Christians, 
right? We, we read ourselves into, that's the supersessionism, that's the replacement, right? And, um, and so, you're, so this goes back to like the era of colonization, right, that we kind of see five, six hundred years ago, where there's a lot of anti-Semitism happening. I mean, there's a lot of anti-Semitism happening in the world for most of history, but um, especially, you know, we see the Inquisition as a huge part of it, the role of that in like Spanish concepts of Christian and Christianity and Spain, Spain and Portugal, who then go on to colonize, be so the first colonizers of the world in that kind of like era of discovery, as they like to say. But um, European Gentiles replace Jewish people in the Bible as God's chosen. And I think a lot of times we erase the Jewishness of Jesus. Like Jesus being Jewish, being born where he was when he was in the body that he was, is integral to understanding the story of the Bible and the mission. And the particularity of who Jesus was, we, when we try to erase that, we also part, begin in this participation of the erasure of our own particularities, our own stories, our own contexts, our own communities um, and circumstances. So this next thing is what I call the Christian parentheses heterosexual script. So, Sarah Ahmed, I think she's a really cool queer theorist if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, she wrote this in her book, or in her chapter, uh, Queer Feelings in the Cultural Politics of Emotion. Of course, one does not do heterosexuality simply through who one does and does not have sex with. Heterosexuality as a script for an ideal life makes much stronger claims. I, I've... I, I've, you know, even before I ever held hands or kissed or had sex with a girl, like, I felt that. I felt that there was this ideal life that was placed to me and integral to that part was heterosexuality. And if I didn't follow that, I couldn't have the good life. <sighs> Queer is not just about sex, right? It's about our orientation towards what is good and what is desirable and also what is beautiful. And so I decided to take her concept about kind of more mainstream, like, you know, heterosexual script, and I decided the Christian, parentheses, heterosexual script. Because who here has not been like, I'm going to be a Christian and I'm going to live the Christian life. And in, implied in that Christian life is mandatory heterosexuality. Right? In order for me to be a Christian, I must be straight. Which leads me to heterosexual soteriology. Um, I love Bridget Eileen Rivera's book. If you've not read Heavy Burdens, I highly recommend it. And one of the things she talks about in one of her chapters is what I've summarized as heterosoteriology. So soteriology is the like fancy word for like salvation, like the study of salvation. How does salvation work? So we've all heard it. You can't be gay and be Christian. Gays go to hell. So implicit in that is the idea that salvation is connected to heterosexuality. We are damned for our queerness. We must be heterosexual to inherit the kingdom of God. Now I'm really reformed and I don't believe that. So, but you don't have to be reformed to believe that, to not believe that either, but I'm just like, that was the comfort to me when I was, you know, in RUF and I was in a PCA church and I was like, but you're telling me that nothing I do earns my salvation, the grace that I've given by God. However, you feel like there's like this asterisk, except if you're gay. So I think that there's like, um, there's like a contradiction here between what we say we believe and then the way that we live it out, which is that disconnect between the head and the body. And it goes back to that idea of some people just have wrong bodies, right? And some people have right bodies. So this is part of the environment that creates our trauma and our rejection and isolation. The thing I really love that Ahmad also used the concept of repetitive stress injuries, RSIs. So she's like, people, like, they contort their bodies and they keep doing these movements again and again and again. And then you actually, I don't know if anyone's, like, have an overuse injury before. And then it actually makes it harder for you to move in other ways, too. And she compares this to the heterosexual script. 
we have to contort our body. Like even if, you know, we're not having sex with anybody or whatever, we're trying to conform to the heterosexual script. And it actually creates injuries upon us that make it harder to move in other ways, right? And so this is part, this Christian parentheses, heterosexual script, is the way that we experience conditional acceptance and participation in the church, right? So, I mean, Karen even talked about this a bit. It's like, okay, well, I just want to, like, show that I'm super gay, right? Everyone knows in theory that I'm gay, but I'm going to, like, act like I'm going to play by the heterosexual script. The other concept that came up in some of my interviews is disgust and pity. And I think, for me, as I was navigating coming out at first, that was the thing I was so afraid of, is that people would push me away, that they would look at me differently, and I wouldn't be the same person to them anymore. And this has to do with the way that power is actually maintained through, in, like, and through legitimacy and intimacy. So I think that generally, like, the people we think of as explicitly homophobic tend to have disgust, right? That's pretty standard. But I think I also, I didn't want people's pity, and I, and I saw that a lot. Like, a lot of well-mentioned straight people <laughs> gave me pity. And I, I didn't want it because I'm like, I am your sister. I'm your equal. I'm not like a wretched, I mean, I'm equally wretched as you, okay? But, like, I'm not a, a special, I'm not, a, like, specially wretched person who needs extra special pity from you. And part of it is to, like, I'm higher up than you and you're below me, right? And it's, it's a way of being nice and maintaining power, Right, and it's also distance. Like you don't hold people close. That's the equality of intimacy. And so this, the use of disgust and pity allows straight people to maintain the power while we stay in their midst, right? You can be, like my friend Blake, he kind of was like, people in the church always like, they'll like this, like, oh, welcome, come to our church. But then this, come close, but not, not that close, stop here. He felt like, he felt that his whole life Everyone say, oh, come close. Oh, no, but not that close. Stay away. And his whole attempt to, like, basically pass in our straight world, Christian world, was trying to keep from getting that. So this is kind of the beginning of where we go next. Um, there's this, also this quote I love from Ahmed. Queer is not then about transcendence or freedom from the heteronormative. Queer feelings are affected by the repetition of the scripts that they fail to reproduce. And this affect is also a sign of what queer can do, of how it can work by working on the heteronormative. So we can think of these things as our failures, but this is actually the place of opportunity of Genesis. This is our Holy Saturday. So uh, the concept of the body, I extend into the concept of phantom limbs. So sometimes when there's an amputation, people's kind of minds don't always catch up to it, and then they'll feel pain in a part of their body that actually isn't connected or exists anymore. And I love this concept because I think about the f of us as the phantom limbs of the body of Christ sometimes. And the parts of us that are missing, either we amputate parts of ourselves so we can stay, or they amputate us out of the body. So why do people stay, and when do people leave? You know, I think, like, it's never that straightforward. I think, you know, I think I've stayed in some places because they were able to give me things that I wanted, that I knew that if I couldn't get if I left, and I had to trade parts of myself. I had to trade conforming a bit or playing by certain rules. Um, like Lauren Berlant is another um, affect theorist, and she talks about um, cruel optimism. Oof, what a what a phrase! <laughs> I feel like a lot of us have had, stayed in a lot of places because we had a, a, an optimism that we could change things or that they could become better. And Berlant's concept is that when does this optimism become cruel? Because the thing that we hope to gain in staying became less valuable than the things we had to give up in order for that. She calls this um, trade value. 
trade. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so she talks about the social economies, like why people stay in these kind of contradictory places, social economies. For me, it's a spiritual economy. Why did I not leave my non-affirming church? I wanted to be a part of the body. I wanted to experience the ecstasy of worship and communion. And I knew that that was worth deal, like, kind of like playing the game a little bit for, right? So worshipers experience pressure to conform and perform or they leave. You're given a choice. Cut off the parts of yourself to stay or cut yourself off from them. Queer discomfort is ultimately generative because it's not about assimilation or resistance but inhabiting norms differently. It does not end with the failure to conform, but it is a beginning for life in a way that does not follow these norms. All I knew was the trauma of either cutting myself off or being cut off until, until I came here and until I found the queer Christian community and I was able to reattach to the body. So this is kind of a little like diagram I made for my thesis. And you can see there's like an individual and then in, the individual participates in worship and music and, the com and then they feel closer and bonded to the community, right? I think we've all experienced that. It's like, and then the community supports and cares for that individual and then, and then when you worship together, you feel even closer and more intimate. This also works in reverse. <laughs> As an individual, you can be rejected and then suddenly you're singing those songs and it just reminds you of all the ways that they don't want you anymore. And it pushes you further from the community. They treat you worse, it gets worse, and then you leave. Because you no longer are able to, to feel that which you wanted, which is the connection to everybody, to God, to the church, to the great cloud of witnesses that was before. So there's a lot of musicology stuff about like healing and trance and music as like therapy, music therapy. But for me, it's also about music can be part of trauma as well as healing. So to understand how music is able to heal, this is like a thing I wrote, is to understand music as a part of the healthy ecology of community, right? Almost every culture in the world, they have dance, they have music, they have something that is like part of the way that they experience life together. In order for an ecosystem to be healthy, its participants must live in harmony and mutuality with one another. And in order to heal a blighted ecosystem, the broken relationships between participants must be brought back to the holistic place of harmony and mutuality. The music just kind of amplifies and intensifies what already is there, right? So, um, some of you may or may not have heard Bianca Louis. She was part of the people who left inner varsity during the purge. Um, and she wrote a, her master's thesis about queer Asian American Christians. And she did a bunch of case studies with them. And so she wrote this, spiritual community is born out of the collective longing for solidarity, communion, and spiritual support in the midst of isolation and loss. For many, spiritual community is about connecting with other, and this is specific in our like queer Asian American sect, but also just true for all queer Christians, Asian Americans, over shared struggles, stories, and hopes. For others, spiritual support occurs with allies who affirm their membership and leadership in the community. Overall, the various forms of Christian community discussed in this section serve as a powerful testament to the redemption and imagination that can occur after spiritual homelessness. Uh, this is like a tweet someone put out. Um, <laughs> um, they went to TRP in Chicago, the conference I just mentioned I was at, and um, they were there with their trans kid, and they said, it's all the same songs I grew up on, but this time, they're for me. Because we knew in all our other communities they were not for us. And so when we sang them, it didn't, it didn't, we weren't able to put our whole bodies in into it, so to speak, because we knew there was this disconnect spiritually that then translated to the way we engaged with the music. So we rewrite the Christian script, right? I don't believe that you need to be heterosexual to be Christian. And I think that actually it's most insidious when it's implied and not explicit. We kind of pull out the reality that they say we can't be gay and be Christian, but they, they kind of like edge around it all the time. Like, no, let's just say it. You believe you cannot be gay and be Christian. And we can move away from the disgust and the pity and the power and the pushing us away to love and joy, intimacy, unity, and wholeness. I think a lot about 
the experience of a leper with Jesus and nobody would touch him. He hadn't experienced intimacy and closeness. And Jesus, Jesus touched him. Jesus came near to him. Jesus embraced him. There is something healing in that. His healing was both spiritual in that moment as well as physiological. In our old communities, there was a policing of participation, right? You have to act a certain way, you have to perform, you have to show up uh, conforming to certain gender things. But what if we came truly as we were so that it was about freedom and liberation? The way that we do this, the way that we change that, you know, there's little things. Some of it is just like, you're literally in a room full of queer people and there's kind of something about that. You don't even have to say anything. But we also explicitly do that. We set the tone, you know. Um, I interviewed a couple worship leaders who are a part of our community here. And they're like, okay, well, when I'm like oh, introducing a song, I'll, you know, acknowledge the pain and the hurt that people might, and I'll invite them to bring their whole selves and to take the parts that they used to hide and to come with them. Sometimes people feel like they need permission for that. But I also want to say, like, you know, some people don't. Thankfully, we're here to support one another, right? So that, like Kai said, like, you, maybe someone needs to give you permission to say that you don't need to care about this thing so much anymore but you also don't need my permission. Go, go and do on your own. You can be comfortable, right? We can worship out of joy as opposed to shame. Um, Darren Calhoun, uh, who I also interviewed for this, he talked about how there is like a lot of shame in a lot of old places, like you need to worship or else this, or like if you don't worship, you're this or whatever. You know, we had to police, say who's in, who's not in, as opposed to like this, is a, just a great rejoicing that we can all come and participate in as much as we do or we don't want to. We get to reconnect to the body, right? But on new terms. I love this quote from James Baldwin. The victim who is able to articulate the situation of the victim has ceased to be a victim. He or she has become a threat. So there's a reason why a lot of Christians hate us. <laughs> because when we are playing by the game, we're submitting, we're conforming ourselves to the Christian heterosexual script. That is still their control, their conditional participation. When we're able to actually name this is what's happening to us, this is a thing you believe, you know, just believe the Bible, you believe in this specific kind of hermeneutic, this sort of value. Right, we're articulating that they are not objective, they are not neutral, they are not universal, right? This is a circumstance. This is a human circumstance, not one that God has actually given to us. And that is a threat, right? And I think for me, I'm, I'm assuming some of you have felt so powerless. Like when I've been discriminated, I was refused communion at my church by an elder once. And he was in the wrong on every level. He, in reality, should have been suspended and maybe removed from his position. That's what the rule book says. That's what our tradition says. But I couldn't do anything to make him want to be accountable to the oath that he took to uphold the rules and the laws of the church, right? I felt so powerless. It doesn't, sometimes it's like, I don't, even if I'm right, what am I supposed to do about that? I can't convince anyone in power to do anything. I think I feel that so much as a queer Christian. And the reality is they were deeply threatened by me. I wasn't asking to change, I wasn't asking to do anything, I was just showing up as I was and that itself was enough of a threat that this guy felt like he had to break all the rules to say you're not a part of the body. You know, the personal is political. You know, as victims we often feel isolated, right? But again, when we connect to other people and we realize we're not alone, we're this thing that happened to me happened to other people and it's not fair and it's not my fault. Then we can take the blame away from ourselves and push it towards organizing to changing things on a macro level, right? You know, people love to victim blame. <laughs> and I felt like I experienced that here. Not only did I experience the healing of being able to people to worship in the body and in this community, but I also found solidarity and I found support and I found the, the opportunity to in, in some ways change our, our circumstances and our status quo by working together, right? And I think this is the other thing that's a part of what 
this corporate body thing is. It's not, it's a lot of things at once, right? Some of it is like, this like metaphysical out of body transcendent experience when you're connected to other people throughout time and space and history as you worship. But also there's just something about knowing that you're not alone in this moment, like sitting in this room or with other gay Christians so that your despair doesn't feel absolute. It's a moment and like God is with you and you, you feel the hands and feet of Jesus through the other members of the body of Christ. So I thought a lot about the last couple of years. We've had a huge growth in the LGBT Christian movement. I felt like I was able to connect with so many other people who it's, you know, similar or different actually experiences than me. And um, I was like, how did a bunch of us end up as like activists? Who knows? Okay. I know this was true for me and many of my other friends who I think of as the leaders and community organizers in our LGBT Christian movement. It's influencers or figureheads, but the people who eventually came and showed us true leadership in moments of difficulty and pain. How did we go from suicidal queer Christian kids getting kicked out of our communities, lost and alone, to leaders of a movement? It's not quite a story of being in the right place at the right time, probably more appropriate to say it was about being at the worst place in the worst times. Most of us just started, less had local community or like connections to other lonely and isolated queer Christians. From there, it became not just trying to keep our individual selves alive, but to keeping our friends alive. A person can only talk so many LGBTQ Christians off the edge of a cliff for so long before it changes you. A person can only beg so many pastors, elders, church leaders, and university presidents to give a damn about the blood that is on their hands and receive a certain amount of platitudes, excuses, and empty words before it radicalizes you. This is our movement from victims to activists. The moral arc of the universe bends towards justice because we bend it. We are reshifting the power, the political, political economy as well as the spiritual economy by saying, we do not have to beg for your acceptance and inclusion in the body of Christ. We are already part of it. And our worship, is a wonderful, beautiful, fragrant offering to God. The thing that you said was disgusting and unacceptable is beautiful, and God welcomes and desires it, and desires us. So that leads me to the last main section about how this affects worship and scripture. So meaning-making happens in this relationship between individual and collective bodies, right? We're in communities, we sing songs, we read scripture together. There are traditions, there are ideas, there are ways that, you know, a verse that's used to oppress certain people in one community is often used to liberate people in another. There was a great pan like panel here, my first QCF. It was um, three different transgender theologians, and they would eat, they, each of them got a like the same scripture, and each one interpreted it totally different, and it was very fun. Um, shout out to Austin Harkey, I miss you, buddy. Um, <laughs> and so, both scripture and music are intertextual, right? So to embodiment. So, you know, there are a lot of songs that were honestly written by like racist white people and who were slave owners. And yet those are songs that are sung in the black church and were part of liberation. And you can use this argument that like, well, the text, it's all about the text and like the, the writer and the originator of the work and say, that person was racist, so this song is racist. However, uh, in the work of James Cone, uh, who wrote The Spiritual and the Blues, and he talked about African-American spirituality, this idea of non-human, right? That some of us are not full human beings. When the beauty of God comes into that, it affirms that what the world says is a non-human being really is fully made in the image of God. And a lot of that is expressed through worship. So for instance, like there's the same song, the same lyrics, the same melody, and you know, somebody else sings it, but it can be totally different when another person sings it, or the same musical note is played on two totally different instruments, right? It, though, that's an example of how embodiment works with things like text and music and pitch to flesh, really like flesh it out, right? Like we focus in the Western academic tradition so much on the text, right? The text itself, the music itself. 
in musicology in my field, there's historically this obsession with music notation. So everyone like takes music notation and they just analyze it and analyze it. They don't even listen to music. They just are like, well, this is related to this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, how can you understand what music it means without listening to it? How can you know what scripture means without living it, right? So this is how we take the swords and we turn them into plowshares as we reflect and re-acknowledge that that embodiment is a deep, deep part of our hermeneutic, whether it's in scripture or, you know, in our worship as well. So, I mean, this is a story you probably heard nationally happen or you've seen it happen or maybe it happened to you. A musician or a worship leader comes out and then the church removes them from that position. So, or maybe they stop, they're like a songwriter, they stop singing their songs. Did the words of that song change? Did the music of that song change? No, to them the meaning changed because they found out a queer person wrote it, right? So this is an example of how this is used in reverse. <laughs> the meaning changed because it's attached to people and communities, right? Um, we experience this, this, the same songs that we may, may have sung in our non-affirming churches can be liberative when they're recontextualized amongst our communities, right? And I think that like, there's a lot of talk about representation and I think it is important, but there's a limit to that, right? And sometimes there's essentialization or even tokenization that can happen and that's actually different than embodiment and incarnation and what I would think of also as inclusion. So. Like, I had a friend who was not a Christian, she's queer, and she was a worship leader, because a lot of times they hire people who, like, are really good at singing and playing guitar. And so, you know, she was like, okay, Sue Ann, like, you do all this stuff around music and embodiment and reclamation, like, how can I do that in my job? And I was like, you're the only person of color <laughs> on the stage. You're, like, you don't feel safe letting other people know that you're queer. Just the fact that you are a queer person saying this doesn't somehow make this liberative or affirming or transformative. The conditions of your context actually are why we have to find liberation because there's all, because this is the conditions of participating and belonging, right? So it's not like we can just say, well, you have this body, so then it means all this, right? The body is intertextual with the community and the power relationships that are part of that. You know, if somebody can't say yes, then they can't say no. So if we make them do and say all these things in order to belong, then they don't really actually belong, right? So this is kind of my like central thing I really want you to take away today. Scripture, as well as worship music, is not in essence homophobic, transphobic, straight, or cisgender. It is often embodied by straight, cisgender, transphobic, and homophobic individuals or institutions which have imbued it with that meaning. Subsequently, we don't need to queer worship or scripture or make the music queer into a race or remove some sort of essential straightness imbued into it. Worship in the gospel is already queer by the nature of Christ indwelling amongst us. And what we need to do is stop erasing that queerness and stop amputating the parts of the body of Christ that have always been and continue to be queer. I know we are all about reclamation. We're all about liberation. And sometimes it feels like we want to add queer things. But I think more of it is we had to take away our queerness in order to participate in other things. And when we show up in that, it is putting back in the right place what was always there that we had to hide or take away. So who has the authority to worship? Who has the authority to interpret scripture and to signify the meaning of music? We are all created in the image of God. We both are imbued with agency and, the, and authority, but not more for one another than any, like not one kind of person more than any kind of other person. And I think that sometimes we work so hard because we wanna win at their game, but it's more reflective of God, more reflective of the power of the body and of scripture to live into what is already there. 
as opposed to thinking we need to make everything new again. Now, I am cool for, you know, people trying new things and innovation and all that. I don't want people to think I'm like a traditionalist. <laughs> but I also, I'm not anti-tradition, right? I think that every, like tradition, sometimes we treat it like a bottle of water and it has really clear boundaries and it's really like clean and whatever. Tradition is not actually that bottle of water. Tradition is a river. Right? And there's all these different kinds of the river at different points and experiences. They're all connected, though. But can you say that one part of the river is more the river than any other parts of the river? People sometimes take that bottle of water into the river, and they scoop up the water and say, okay, this is the tradition. When we really examine history, we'll see that there's a lot of people, and they're messy, because we're messy. <laughs> and it's always not that. It's, it's kind of like Kai was saying. We kind of want to oversimplify. Oh, this is the narrative, or this is the narrative. People are just messy. And the good news is that God came down to earth in human form and became messy himself. So there is redemption, there is glory, and there is the divine in that. And we don't need to erase that part of our human self to become divine because the divine God already became human. <laughs> Some of you may or may not know I have this album. It's called A Liturgy for the Perseverance of the Saints. And I decided I want to take these ideas that I've been thinking about and I want to put it into some music that means a lot to me from my community, from the PCA, from this hymns community that I was a part of. And so um, if you're interested, feel free to check it out. I also hope that more musicians, more people, more worship leaders continue in this process too. I don't think that there's one kind of musical style or worship tradition that is better or more righteous or more glory, like more, more, more full of glory than others. I think that we, like in the book of Revelation, all from every tongue, every nation, and every culture will bring our gifts, and that there's something to celebrate, something to learn, and something to glory in in every culture, in any com every community, in every tradition. For me, this is what's honest about who I am and where I come from and the kind of music that I really like. And so I felt like, okay, I don't need to give that up when I now am like a queer Christian activist or a queer worship leader. They, I, in my thesis, I actually talked about two different worship leader songwriters from my like conservative Presbyterian world who were queer. And they wrote music and played music in Indelible Grace, which is like our like record label thing. And their relationship to the community after they came out and kind of, you know, when I listen to their music, I hear the queerness in it. You know, it, it, they had to hide it, but sometimes I feel it comes out anyway. And I wanna live in a world now that they don't have to hide that. And also that people will not erase them from the stories of our community and our music anymore. The way that like Vicky Beeching, right? Like people are like, we will not sing your songs anymore. We will rip these songs out of the hymnals because it was a queer person who sang them. Again. We've always been a part of the body to the point that they had to artificially work to amputate and take us out. So let's just put them back where it belongs. Isn't that the word? The work of God is reconciliation of bringing back together. You know, we can look at a valley of dry bones and say, but God, can these bones live? And the spirit of God will come and put flesh and breath and life again into that which we do not know is possible to bring back together again. Um, my last like little slide quote is from Willie James Jennings, who is such an inspiration to me. I love this quote. The possibility of a conversation that has yet to happen, a Christianity born of the colonialist wound speaking to itself in its global reality, pressing deeply inside the miracle of its existence, battered, bruised, marginalized, yet believing, loving. Christian. For better or worse, many of those who Fanon, Fanon, Fanon called the wretched of the earth became and are in fact Christians. Yet the post-colonial has yet to encounter this Christianity, Catholic, Protestant, Pentecostal, syncretic, and consider its struggles, sometimes reflecting the death of the colonial imagination and at other times showing new life, new possibilities, gesturing towards the joining. We are all a part of that joining. And I encourage you to continue to embrace that which God is revealing, 
that people may not know or believe. Just because like, you know, the authorities that exist, they do things a certain way, doesn't mean we actually have to do what they say or totally do the opposite and react. We can actually respond and show, again, I don't need to prove to you that God is in me, God is already here. Just show up and find out. So my encouragement is that all of you, wherever you go, know that you are connected that you do not have to be tr alone and isolated, and that the body welcomes you. Uh, I recently read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, and he had this really interesting quote where he said, like, people who work towards, like, the brotherhood of fellowship, right? Like, you don't actually need to work towards it because our fellowship, our brotherhood is actually already a reality in Christ. So to me, so much of it is living into the reality of what already is there, as opposed to we need to do this. But again, it, the wound would not hurt if their connection was not so deep, right? So I think that as we navigate this, we need to be really gentle with ourselves. You know, you don't need to like shame, again, do not need to shame yourself into going back to a church or doing this thing again. Everything can happen in good time. You know, as people are recovering from injuries, like you do, you know, um, rehab, you know, and if you push yourself too hard, you re-injure yourself. But if you don't do anything at all, you don't get better. <laughs> so I think as we're also all on this journey together, we can encourage each other, but we could both to rest as God commanded us, but and to take the time to let land lay fallow to, to grow again, and also to be willing to try and see what might be on the other side at living life after trauma in pain. So, um, like, okay, let me see. Like the resurrected Christ, we still carry the trauma and the wounds of our affliction. The holes in our hands and sides, we will always carry our loss and trauma with us, but there is yet hope. There is still yet life. Um, freedom is what you do with what has been done to you. This is um, a quote from my, the end of my thesis. After watching a part of yourself die and living through a resurrection, you have the rest of your life to live. My RUF minister used to say to me, there is no free from, only free to. And so what are we free to now? We are free to live, free to love, free to serve, free to worship. There are graduations, birthdays to celebrate, and weddings to attend, babies and baptisms. There are camping trips, pool days, book or album releases, and I love a potluck. There are entire lives left for us to live, lives that we never imagined we could get to have. Now they're ours to have and to fight to keep. This is, the con this is our theme of this concept, liberated to love. We have not been liberated simply, you know, to do whatever, but to love, to grow, to share that which was given to us, to turn our mourning into dancing, our weeping into singing. Healing in some ways is the joy. It's the life that we now are saddled with the possibility of living with. I want to end this with um, a little bit from one of my favorite hymns. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And through eternity, I'll sing on. Thank you. How are we on time? I want to be respectful. What is this supposed to end? Oh my gosh. Okay. I timed that pretty well. Okay.
Any questions, responses, any song requests? Anyone want to sing some stuff together? <laughs> Okay, so I have a Patreon. If you look up my name, you won't find anyone else. Um, hopefully, I was thinking of putting out just for my Patreon people, but I actually am looking for a publisher right now because I want to put this out as a book. So you can also just contact me and maybe I'll email it to you because I don't really care. But also, if anyone knows a publisher who might be interested in this, you know. <laughs> cool. Any other? other questions. Also, I'm on Twitter at Sue Ann Shaw, Instagram. I know Elon is a mess, but I'm still there. Um, yeah, I hate him, but, you know, in the way that I hate people because I love them because Jesus loves them, but, okay. Um, he's ruining a place that I love. <laughs> anyway, anybody? Yeah, another I've question? got a cool. question here. Hi. Okay, they'll turn it on. Um, at your last point of recontextualizing worship pieces, songs, things like that, short of, I mean, other than just a worship leader saying, we now own this, this doesn't have to be theirs, it could be ours, what are practical things that would help a community recontextualize or reclaim mm. music or, yeah. or whatnot? So I think that if you are in an environment in a church that practices what they preach, basically, that that actually makes the worship good <laughs> in a certain way. Like, in my old church, like, we we were so involved in each other's lives. Like, I got a flat tire once, and I just posted it on our listserv, and, like, five people showed up <laughs> to help me with my, you know, flat tire. And um, I, shout out to Hen UMC. Uh, I just took a music minister job with them. Um, so, yeah. There's some people wearing t-shirts. Uh, it's a Zoom church, so actually if you're looking for a community, you don't have a place to worship in, um, that's available to you wherever you live, but it's mostly like people in the New York, New Jersey area, which is where I live now. Um, I think that the question is different for whether you're straight versus if you're queer. Because I do think that sometimes queer, like straight allies, they want to help in this process. And the things that they can do are actually kind of different than the things that queer people can do. Um, I think that, like, you know, your church's policies, those are a big part of it because people don't feel like they can really show up to worship in themselves if there's things that they have to hide or conditions for their participation. So um, I actually really push that we change policies and the power dynamics of our churches and that that will help the worship actually change in a lot of ways. Um, I also think that we need, sometimes people feel like they need permission to sing. Like, um, I'm in a lot of like progressive Christian or like evangelical, post evangelical spaces, and a lot of people are actually really afraid to worship because they have so much trauma attached to it. And I'm like, dude, at, at QCF, we always sing. <laughs> I was like, we always worship. But part of it is actually because of the embodiment of this community, that everyone shows up pretty, I mean, you have some allies, but most of the people here are queer. And so there's already this implicit kind of like, oh, you come as you are, you are queer, you're loved and accepted, and that changes the worship. Whereas I think in maybe some of those mostly straight spaces, they don't actually know that they're like, they, have, they can belong, they, they love, the church accepts them. And so it makes the worship feel really insecure, right? Because we don't even know what the meaning of this community is yet, so therefore the meaning of our worship is, is also like unsure to people. Not to say that people don't like experience kind of, I, I think people do are experience some sort of triggering when they first come to QCF because they might hear songs that they previously associated with their trauma and then their brains are like, or their bodies are also just like, oh, what is happening? And then eventually you're just like, people are like taking care of you and you're like, we love you and it's great. And like, and then your body is actually able to create new kind of neural pathways to like re-signify what things are. So like I did EMDR, which I recommend to a lot of people for my PTSD. And one of the things that we do, we did in my, and you do in EMDR is you actually go back to your traumatic memories and you kind of like walk through them again. But when you're doing that, you're able to take some of the like the things that you associated with those traumatic memories and turn them into other things. And so my the traumatology portion of my thesis actually argues this is kind of what we do when we worship, is we're like going back into those traumatic memories associated with these songs and we're rewriting them in a safe place. Right. So like an example is like one of my first EMDR sessions, like I was like reliving a coffee that I had with my pastor <laughs> where he basically kicked us, kicked me out of our college ministry. And 
Um, I always associate it with rejection, loneliness, isolation, like feeling dirty, feeling unsafe, like other people, other Christians couldn't even be around me because I would taint them. And then actually when I did EMDR and we reprocessed that memory, like it turned into, wow, you were so courageous. Like you were convicted and you did the hard thing. And it's not that like the rejection didn't happen, but rather the association that my body now had with that was like, was a positive one as opposed to one that just reinforced how isolated and alone I felt. So I think that kind of also plays into like, how do we think about um, worship? Because part of the thing about EMDR is it's bilateral stimulation. Um, because like with, re like it kind of like is about like, you know, REM, it's like rapid eye movement. So you're like back and forth. So it's a kind of bilateral stimulation. And so I think that like, Music is really cool because it's an entirely embodied experience. It's both intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and physical. And so there's a lot of ways that we are doing bilateral, like bilateral things that kind of stimulate our bodies when we're engaging in worship. And so it's not, quite, it's not therapy, but it is in some ways therapeutic. So <laughs> um, I hope that kind of addresses what you're talking about. Okay, maybe one more and then I will, you know, we'll have lunch. <laughs> Okay, any song requests? We want to close it out. We can sing something together and be fun. Okay. Um, Come thou found. Oh, you want to sing together? Well, stand. Let's all stand and sing together. <laughs> Come thou found of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the throne of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. All right, thank you all. Thanks for joining me today.